Right. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to an exciting day uh, of, of this uh, two-day Sci-Fi Symposium uh, hosted by uh, RBC CPS. Uh, and we have a special session right now, which is sort of more uh, looking at some of uh, uh, the research going on uh, at, uh, within the Institute itself uh, in, in the area of uh, cyber physical system, autonomous systems, and so on. And we have a sort of very strong slate of uh, uh, faculty, up and coming uh, <laughs> faculty with, with, with some really promising research and sort of the young Turks uh, that, that we have to showcase in the next hour or so. Uh, and uh, first up, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Jishnu Keshwan, uh, who is going to be talking on bio inspired sensory motor control. Uh, Jishnu is an assistant professor at mechanical engineering at IAC. His research lie broadly in the area of dynamic systems theory, nonlinear dynamics and control and autonomous vision. And uh, he has a uh, PhD in aerospace engineering from University of Maryland. So Jishnu, uh, please take it over. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Professor Simon. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, so my topic today, uh, or so rather my talk today, will be centered on the topic of bio-inspired sensory motor control uh, with particular relevance to uh, urban, reactive urban navigation applications. And so to motivate this problem a little bit, uh, shown here on the left is uh, a video of uh, Amazon's recent, uh, recently developed uh, delivery platform. This is the Amazon Air. And so if you actually look at the video, uh, I'll play this video again. If you look at the video here, what it does is it's basically currently deployed in a very controlled setting. Right, so it's basically flying in a mainly obstacle-free arena, so to actually accomplish package delivery. So as opposed to you know uh, solving this uh, or rather uh, uh, deploying a system that looks like this, what really needs to happen if you wish to deploy a system like this in a typical urban environment, is that as opposed to you know accomplishing just point-to-one navigation, which is what this platform does at the moment, you need to be able to you know deploy a system that can actually adapt to complex and varied structure, which is what an urban environment is. And so you also need to be able to, and this is especially especially true of aerial vehicles, they need to be able to uh, overcome disturbances that are typically of the order of uh, platform capabilities. So all of this actually makes it really challenging to synthesize closed loop systems that, uh, with rigorous performance guarantees. And so our objective has been, as opposed to accomplishing just point-to-point -point or waypoint navigation, we wish to accomplish waypoint navigation while uh, 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 coupling that with a reactive navigation loop, which is able to overcome the problem of, you know, um, uh, static and mobile clutter. And so the real, the key question that has motivated this problem for me at least is the uh, design of control systems, closed loop systems, where we generate useful motion cues and make rapid control decisions while achieving uh, uh, rigorous performance guarantees in, in such navigationally challenging environments. And so that's been overarching theme of a lot of my work over the recent past. And so if you look at, if you conduct a literature survey of uh, the studies in the recent past in this area, uh, if you look at the state of the art in terms of sensing and processing paradigms that have been deployed for these kinds of applications, you see that in contrast with the GPS, which gives us a position fix and IMU, which gives us a fix of not just the attitude, but the angular uh, and linear velocities as well. And the laser range finder, which slightly differently gives us proximity information or encodes information of the surrounding scene structure. We have a camera that actually gives us information from a combination of these sensors, right? So for instance, it gives us information of the linear and angular velocities of camera, as well as information encoding surrounding scene structure. And so in a way, camera actually does the job of two or more sensory modalities. And so a camera is a really nice sensor to work with. And the other uh, attractive uh, uh, advantage offered by camera is the bandwidth it can operate at, right? For instance, in comparison with some of the other sensors, which actually have a fairly low bandwidth, sensing bandwidth, we have a camera that can actually be deployed at, at, at bandwidths needed to perceive and react uh, rapidly in the presence of static and mobile critter. And so that is what a very attractive, uh, that makes it a very attractive sensing modality for applications like these. And so on the other hand, if you look at the uh, control architectures that are deployed for applications like these, you see typically see a hierarchical control architecture, one where you actually have a mission planner that plans waypoint or path planner that um, plans waypoints uh, for uh, the vehicle to follow, uh, which typically happens at uh, time scales of about one to 10 seconds or so. And then at the, at the lower level, we actually have a slightly faster loop, which is the reactive navigation, uh, uh, where uh, the need for reactive navigation is felt. And so the, this is where uh, the, the need for uh, synthesizing closed loop with bandwidth uh, for uh, being able to, uh, that can actually perceive and react to clutter is really felt. And so the, these uh, uh, closed loops actually are uh, uh, operate at a bandwidth of about uh, 
one tenth of a second or so, even up between a one tenth to a hundred one hundredth of a second or so. And then at the, at the lowest loop is obviously the uh, the loop that actually accomplishes uh, flight stabilization. And so this actually has to be the fastest. And so it actually typically happens at about um, hundreds of seconds or so. And so this is a typical hierarchical control architecture that is typically deployed for applications like these. And so if you actually look at the block diagram and see what the stumbling block is in, in, in health, that could actually um, uh, be the hindrance for improving the closed loop bandwidth, you actually see that it's a map extraction uh, block here, which actually encodes three different sub modules, uh, which, uh, which actually slows down the bandwidth of the closed loop. And so, uh, main motivating factor for a lot of my research has been the ability to synthesize a reactive navigation strategy without the need for building a map. And that's purely based on instantaneous input output data. And so to do that, uh, uh, we've looked at uh, bio-inspiration, the idea of bio-inspiration, where we actually seek inspiration from nature. And the reason we do that is across different insect species, uh, for instance, locust, where a mechanosensory array is deployed uh, is actually used, is leveraged for accomplishing both uh, flight control and gust stabilization. You have the fruit flies uh, compound eye, which actually is used for reactive navigation. Uh, and we have, interestingly, we have the Mexican blind cave fish, uh, which actually deploys what's known as electrolocation for accomplishing wall following and proximity detection. And finally, we have the arachne, which actually deploys this distributed uh, tactile uh, sensing array for accomplishing prey localization. So all of these different species actually uh, deploy the same sensory motor convergence strategy. And so their nervous systems, are, all of them uh, form useful reductions of high dimensional sensory data. And they do that by forming simple representations of surrounding environments and rich sensory input streams. And so they are extremely efficient uh, at uh, coming up with computation constraint paradigms that satisfy size, weight, power, and bandwidth requirements. And so. The other reason why by inspiration plays um, is very attractive is that insects actually are, as we all notice, or are, as we all know, are extremely good at operating across a wide range of conditions. And so that the way they do that is by leveraging fast computationally simple perceptual capabilities that actually lead to robust flight uh, feedback control architectures, and which actually is what helps them realize robust flight uh, behaviors. And so that is the main reason why by inspiration actually is so attractive. And so if you actually delve into the insect eye architecture a little bit, we actually see that the insect eye, as opposed to uh, a human eye, is a compound eye, in that it encodes individual, numerous individual sensory elements known as umatidia. They have about 60 units per compound eye that encompass the whole visual field. And so for a typical insect that deployed, say, in a typical wooded environment, that either one that's uh, translating as shown in this image on the left, or that's rotating as shown in this image on the right, uh, they, these eyes actually capture what are known as incident of incident. They capture patterns of incidence known as optic flow, which actually are spread over the whole visual field as shown here. And so these patterns of optic flow, which are spread over the whole visual field, actually encode information uh, not just of the relative motion of the observer in this case, the insect relative to its environment, but also encodes information of surrounding scene structure. And so. These patterns of luminance are then parsed, or, the, or these patterns of optic flow are then parsed in a suitable manner uh, to generate this handful of flight motor commands. So you have this uh, pat, uh, principle of sensory motor convergence that actually is uh, followed to generate these flight motor commands that rely, that lead to these robust flight behaviors. And so the key to do that is to mathematically to be able to replicate that behavior is to mathematically model uh, these patterns of optic flow and then parse them in a manner that insects do. And so to that end, we have optic flow, which actually gives us a speed over depth quantity. And so it basically encodes relative speed, not just of the observer relative to its environment, but also surrounding scene structure, and hence gives us relative proximity information. And so if you look at the mathematical expression for optic flow, it encodes contribution uh, omega uh, that comes from the observer's rotation, but also a con contribution from the observer's translational motion that's coupled by this nearness parameter mu, which actually is the inverse of the radial distance to fiducial markers or uh, obstacles in the surrounding environment. So that's the key. Uh, uh, so that's the key uh, sensory input here, the patterns of optic flow spread across the whole visual field, which can then be passed in a suitable manner to generate these uh, numerous flight behaviors. And so the way the insects actually parse these uh, patterns of optic flow is through a process known as wide field integration, where they rely on a set of basis functions. Uh, that actually span the whole visual field uh, to parse these patterns of optic flow that re realize these optic flow outputs why that are purely a function of the vehicle's instantaneous states and so then these patterns of also these patterns of optic flow outputs which are just a purely a function of the vehicle states can then be embedded within a, a typical traditional feedback control loop uh, and through uh, a straightforward lq or a 
a more complicated H infinity synthesis architecture, one could actually then realize either simple wall following or more complicated navigation in urban like environments. And so to illustrate this example shown here is uh, the flight of a fruit fly in a typical straight line corridor like environment where the objective is for the fruit fly to actually follow the center line of the corridor. So for any small perturbations above the center line, the optic flow pattern as and since we are focusing on uh, navigation in a plane, the optic flow pattern is going to be uh, uh, a, peri uh, a, pe a periodic function of the visual angle gamma, visual uh, viewing angle gamma. So it's going to be periodic over 2 pi. And so uh, a typical uh, basis uh, function set that could be used to decompose these patterns of optic flow would then naturally be uh, the harmonics of the Fourier series. And so we have the DC component and the first two components, cosine components of the harmonic series, which we actually see uh, as shown here, which could then be used to parse these patterns of optic flow. And then we actually see that they actually give rise to these linear combinations of these states that are really useful for accomplishing center line uh, uh, and wall following behaviors. And so these patterns of optic flow can then be embedded again in a feedback loop to realize you know, a simple straightforward center line following strategy. And so a similar strategy can then be extended to you know, accomplishing uh, reactive navigation in urban like environments. And so you can actually couple that with a more sophisticated, uh, robust controller synthesis frameworks uh, like the one shown here, for instance, it can be used to achieve numerous performance objectives. Like for, for those of you who are familiar with what this diagram here is, uh, the singular value diagram shown here is, uh, it's, it's, it, it, the diagram emphasizes the fact that we can actually synthesize robust controller frameworks that uh, meet uh, performance objectives across the whole frequency spectrum. For instance, you have performance objectives at the lower end of the frequency spectrum, which would be gust mitigation and reference tracking, and you would have noise attenuation at the higher end of the frequency spectrum. And so combination of that with uh, the emphasis on coming up with a robust stability and performance objective actually leads to behaviors that actually look like these. So shown here is a simulation of the actual vehicle, which relies purely on op optic flow to actually uh, you know, find its way through a typical urban environment. So this is a single uh, sample of its trajectory as it tries through this environment. Again, uh, it needs to be emphasized that this is purely reactive. There's no element of planning involved. But this, as simple as the strategy is actually works really well when, even, uh, when it's deployed even in a real world setting. So for instance, when it's flying through uh, not just a straight line corridor, but it's flying along uh, a corridor of different widths and different shapes, it actually seems to do fairly well uh, as long uh, in uh, keeping to the center line. And so again, entirely, all of this is entirely based on um, optic flow feedback. So while, uh, so this strategy actually works really well in being able to perceive and react to large obstacles, uh, you need a complementary strategy uh, that actually can overcome the problem of small obstacle detection and avoidance. And so to do that, we actually, again, go back uh, to the idea of planar optic flow, which is a periodic signal over the spatial uh, window uh, gamma. And so these patterns of optic flow in the presence of wide field obstacles induce low frequency spatial patterns. And in the presence of small field obstacles induce high frequency spatial patterns in optic flow. And so the idea then is to actually be able to uh, detect uh, low frequency perturbations arising from wide field obstacles and remove that from the incident pattern to sharpen small field detection. So that's the key idea behind uh, small field detection and avoidance applications. And so we actually have two applications, uh, two approaches here, the first of which is the Fourier residual, where we follow the same, this, the previous strategy of, of uh, extracting wide field component of optic flow and simply subtracting that from the incident pattern. And then this pattern of this small field component then actually encodes information that's useful for accomplishing reactive navigation in uh, a typical uh, obstacle laden environment, which is range and bearing to the nearest obstacle. And so one could actually extract these particular motion cues from the small field signal and combine that with a typical steering controller law, like the one used here to be able to uh, uh, realize very robust obstacle avoidance behaviors. So in contrast with this very simple strategy, we also, we also looked at a slightly more complex bio-inspired strategy for small field detection and avoidance. So where we actually um, use uh, a second set of elementary motion detectors detectors that are basically used to compute optic flow. And so we have flow of optic flow. And so this approach is known as flow of flow, which again has been mathematically shown to uh, give us the same kind of information that we have with the previous strategy. So we still extract the small field component of optic flow, which could then be used to uh, uh, get a fix of the range and bearing to the nearest obstacle, which could then again be uh, coupled with the same control law as before to be able to accomplish results that look like these. So we've been able to show results uh, at a closed loop bandwidth of about 60 Hertz or so. In fact, there is promise of actually even going faster 
the idea is to improve the bandwidth to about 120 hertz or so. And I, we have been able to show in some experiments that we can actually reach 120 hertz or so. And so if you can see, look at the video here, we see that the vehicle is actually, uh, at each instant, the vehicle, uh, the yellow marker there actually uh, points to the nearest obstacle. And that gives us both the range and the bearing. And that is what is used to evade that particular obstacle in the local environment. And so this is a very safe, inherently safe data-driven strategy. Uh, where the vehicle is actually confined to free space. And so it actually uh, leverages an efficient perception actuation loop uh, that actually works well amidst not just static clutter, but also offers a promise of working well uh, amidst uh, mobile clutter. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll quickly just show a couple more videos and just wrap up my uh, presentation here. Thank so uh, we extended this to the case of a ground vehicle as well, where we've shown reactive, uh, we have combined reactive navigation strategy uh, where we both the strategies of small field and large field obstacle avoidance with a waypoint uh, tracking strategy as well. And so we've shown both reactive and waypoint navigation in this particular experiment here. So uh, since we may not have time, so I'll actually skip quickly to the next last slide and then be done with it wrap it up. So shown here, differently from the previous video, shown here is the example of a Mexican blind cavefish. Uh, shown here is in this video is an example of a Mexican blind cavefish, which actually is demonstrating wall falling behaviors. And in contrast with vision, it actually is shown to deploy electrolocation. So it actually deploys what's known as a dipole sensory ring, which actually is used to generate a nominal electrostatic potential field. And any perturbation in this electrostatic potential field, which arises from the presence of surrounding obstacles in the local environment, could then be detected and could then be fed back within a typical control loop to demonstrate wall following and obstacle avoidance behaviors as shown in this experiment here. So it's again just goes to show that this principle of sensory motor convergence and by inspired sensory motor control works across a range of different uh, platforms uh, and across a range. Uh, uh, that is aerial ground and underwater and across the different domains again aerial ground and underwater and across a range of different sensory modalities uh, vision and electrolocation in this case so it's a very versatile strategy and this is probably the reason why a lot of insect species actually leverage this strategy to actually you know accomplish robust flight behaviors or navigational behaviors and so to wrap it up uh, the idea behind sensory motor convergence looking at sensory motor convergence is to actually uh, leverage the principles of sensory motor convergence and combine that with tools from traditional control architecture and replicate, hopefully replicate the performance of natural systems. And so the main question as applied to navigational problems is to uh, uh, synthesize control systems that, fail, that help us make rapid control decisions in the face of uncertainty and very potentially very noisy data. And so we've been able to leverage some of these points by strategies for demonstrating both large field and small field obstacle avoidance, even uh, as uh, together with waypoint navigation to our world. So with that, I'll probably wrap this up and thanks uh, for listening to me. Thanks, Professor Simon. I think I'm done. Thanks a lot, Jishnu. Really appreciate it. Really fascinating work. It's really nice to see things actually translated into working prototype in the video. Sure. Exceptional. And I'm sure uh, others can look up your website and find more information. Certainly. Uh, so next up, I'm going to invite Pawan uh, Telapagada to uh, share his uh, slides. And meanwhile, if there's any quick question for uh, Jishnu, he can take it while Pawan is setting up. Okay. Uh, if not, uh, uh, please hold your questions and maybe take it offline with Jishnu. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Pawan uh, to uh, as the next speaker in this uh, uh, RBCPS session. So Pawan is an assistant professor at uh, the uh, Electrical Engineering Department as well as the uh, Bosch Center. And he is also from University of Maryland. He got his uh, PhD from over there. Uh, and his research interests include network control systems, distributed systems and control, and multi-agent systems. And he's won many laurels in this context, including uh, the uh, outstanding paper award at Transactions on Control uh, of Networks. And uh, Pawan's going to be talking about, as it says, population dynamics on networks. Pawan, all yours. Okay, uh, thanks Yogesh uh, for the introduction and thanks uh, for the invitation too. Uh, so I hope you can see my uh, slides. You can hear yes. me clearly. Okay, great. So uh, as Yogesh said, I'll be talking on uh, population dynamics and networks today. And uh, compared to uh, most of the talks in the symposium, uh, the theme of this uh, talk and uh, the motivations are uh, somewhat different. Uh, and uh, basically the, uh, the, at a very high level, the main idea of, uh, uh, or main motivation for this work is that in a lot of large scale systems, uh, we have populations of agents in the loop. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So, um, and, and these agents, for example, they could be robots or they could be some other agents too. 
so for example, we can uh, think about large swarms with a very large uh, collection of robots. And certainly what we're going to talk about today in this uh, uh, presentation, it is going to be applicable uh, for such settings too. Right? So let's say if we want to control a large form of robots uh, without directly controlling each individual robot, but just by giving some aggregate signals. So that is certainly possible. Uh, but I also want to talk about uh, other uh, situations or other systems, large scale systems, where there are uh, uh, large populations involved. And uh, these populations could be uh, of uh, humans, actually, in some sense, or uh, other uh, agents too. So uh, as an example, let's think about, uh, let's say, uh, navigation using Google Maps. We all do that. It's very useful. But as uh, thousands and thousands of people do it in a city, it has the potential to change the traffic patterns. Right? And similarly, uh, we can also think about how, uh, let's say, uh, more choices of population uh, evolve over time, right? as there are disruptions uh, in either technology or maybe uh, because there is new infrastructure and so on, right? And uh, uh, we can also think about uh, other uh, populations, like let's say populations of insects and so on, uh, and we can think about migration of uh, these entities, right? So if you, uh, if you remember, so last year there was a, a big locust swarm that migrated all the way from Africa to India, and uh, this form was destroying crops in, uh, in its path, essentially. So uh, certainly studying how these uh, insect forms migrate uh, from one place to another and all such things, uh, they are useful uh, for planning and so on. Uh, similarly, I mean, we may be interested in things like migration of people uh, across countries or within a country and, uh, uh, or in a more abstract sense, let's say, uh, towards certain professions and so on, okay. And uh, so of course, these kind of problems have been studied under uh, you know, various different disciplines uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, one thing is uh, the dynamical systems perspective uh, has been somewhat limited. Right? So studies using dynamical systems perspective is somewhat limited. And uh, so such a perspective is certainly useful particularly when we are thinking about behavior of large populations under disruptions. Right? So certainly we have seen uh, many different kinds of disruptions in the last few years, uh, let's say in the transportation world, either because uh, some new service like Uber came into being, or uh, especially in India, we have had many uh, metro services beginning in many different cities. And in the telecom sector, we know uh, what Geo has done. Uh, and in the past one year, of course, uh, we know again uh, many things uh, that have happened uh, due to COVID-19 uh, and so on. Okay, so one is the migrant labor issue itself and the other is now uh, many of us are working from home, at least those of us who have jobs and so on, right? And uh, some of this may continue, right? So working from home uh, may continue in many sectors for a long time. Right, so essentially, so what we see is in many of these problems, so we of course have dynamics, right? So, and, okay, as I said, uh, so uh, some people have been studying these kinds of things for a long time, uh, but more importantly here, we also have some either spatial constraints in uh, what these agents can uh, advise their choices to, or uh, even in an abstract setting, there can be some constraints. So that we model by essentially a network, so uh, what we have is essentially a network of choices where the nodes represent choices, uh, the edges represents uh, some constraints uh, between uh, some constraints on how these agents can revise their choices and so on. Okay, we consider a population of a continuum of agents and then uh, nodes represent the choices made by agents at any given time. And uh, essentially uh, uh, the dynamics comes about by uh, this process of agents seeking to maximize their payoff function by moving on the network. Okay, so uh, formally we denote uh, by this xi as the fraction of population that is there in node i at any given time t. Okay, and then uh, this pi is the cumulative payoff function of node i. So just as an example, if we think about the fleet uh, redistribution problem that we were just talking about a little while back, so there, uh, the nodes can represent uh, the service locations or regions in a city. Uh, Xi is the fraction of the fleet that is there in a node I. 
and the PI is a measure of profitability or demand and all that. Okay, so uh, in fact, a minor contribution of our work is uh, so-called stratified payoffs. So we assume that agents in a given node uh, don't all receive the same average payoff, uh, or rather they don't receive the same payoff. Uh, rather, uh, so what we say is if uh, Xi is the fraction in node I, then uh, any subinterval AB that is of uh, subinterval of zero to Xi that we call as a strata, and that strata receives uh, essentially this PIE minus PIA divided by P minus A. And that is nothing but the area under the curve of uh, the derivative of this uh, average payoff or this payoff function PI. Uh, and uh, this, uh, that derivative we call as payoff density uh, function and that is uh, denoted by UI. Okay, so uh, for the analysis to be tractable and so on, so we assume that these PIs are uh, twice continuously differentiable and uh, strictly concave. So uh, in terms of interpretation, so this translates to uh, a setting that is related to where the returns are. Uh, so or rather we have diminishing returns. So payoff functions capture something to do with diminishing returns. So the cumulative payoff of uh, agents in node i is this pi of xi minus pi zero and then social utility is just the sum of all the uh, uh, cumulative payoffs of agents in, uh, in all the nodes. Uh, the class of dynamics that we consider uh, is something that we call as flow balance dynamics, and it is uh, easily expressed uh, in this uh, very simple form, actually. Uh, so we look at any two neighboring nodes in the graph, and then uh, we associate outflows uh, from one node to the other that we denote by this delta ij. Okay, and then uh, the rate of change of uh, the fraction in node i is simply uh, the overall inflow to node i at that time minus the overall outflow from that node i. Okay, concisely we can just uh, express it in the form of this uh, vector uh, equation. So x dot uh, is equal to j times delta x and j is the incidence matrix here and delta, this capital delta x uh, aggregates together all these small delta j's. And so that is the dynamics. Okay, so now uh, we get different dynamics uh, if we choose different delta uh, of x functions. Okay, and we will consider uh, three such dynamics now. Uh, but no matter what that delta of x is, uh, we can immediately say we can make the simple observation that uh, the simplex, right, uh, that is this uh, set, uh, set of all non negative vectors such that one transpose b is equal to one. So that simplex is positively invariant under this dynamics, no matter what this delta of x is. Okay. So it's it's a simple observation, but it's it's useful. Okay, so uh, we consider three dynamics, uh, each with the varying degrees of coordination among the agents. The first one is for selfish agents, okay, and uh, this we call as stratified Smith dynamics. Uh, we take the standard Smith dynamics in the literature and then we adapt it to our uh, setting where we have stratified payoff functions. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, because I mean it's it's a minor extension of some existing dynamics, so I won't really go into much details about that. So uh, rather, I'll talk about the remaining two dynamics. The first of which is uh, the so-called nodal best response dynamics. So in here, what is happening is uh, at each node i, so at each time instant, uh, the agents in node i they solve an optimization problem. And this optimization problem, um, so I'll just interpret what this problem is. So what it says is it looks at all the uh, population fraction in that node i, and it says what is the optimal redistribution of that uh, uh, population fraction among its, the node i and its neighbors. Okay, and uh, okay, so we get a solution, and that is what determines the dynamics. Okay, so dynamics is as we have seen in the previous slide, with delta i j is now as solutions of this optimization problem. Uh, notice that we have an optimization problem for each node i. So if we have n nodes, then we have n optimization problems to solve, and that gives the overall dynamics. Uh, the third dynamics is this network restricted payoff maximization. This is uh, a centralized dynamics where uh, there is coordination among agents across all nodes, and there is one optimization problem where the overall social utility is maximized. Uh, with the network restricting the mo movements that are uh, the possible movements of uh, the agents. Okay, so that is what this is. Okay, so again, the uh, the optimizer of this uh, problem 
is what gives us this delta ig of x. So uh, just one point here. So this P2i uh, is a nice optimization problem. Okay, so this has, uh, by the way, both these optimization problems are always feasible, uh, but this P2i, it, it always has a unique optimizer. Okay, so there is no question of uh, this dynamics being well-defined or not, right? it, it's well-defined. Uh, but for this NRPM, uh, we don't have unique optimizers, but the thing is, uh, even, uh, even if we have multiple optimizers, this J times delta X is always unique. Okay, so uh, the dynamics is still unique even in the case of an RPM. So uh, with this, uh, I just want to talk about the first main result. And, so just a one minute heads up, if you could wrap up in a minute, that'd be great. Okay, but I also started a bit late. Yeah, I'm trying to so, go to that, yeah. Okay, fine, I'll try to finish as soon as possible. Okay, so, uh, so then uh, for these three dynamics, uh, what we show is that we have existence and uniqueness of solutions. And then, um, okay, so it is a bit challenging, especially in the case of NPRD and NRPM, because the dynamics is really coming out of uh, optimization problems. And then uh, we have uh, asymptotic convergence to a set of Nash equilibria, and uh, the social utility also converges. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I won't really go into uh, some of these details. So one thing I want to uh, talk about is that uh, uh, even though we have greater coordination, uh, the fact is that uh, they're still myopic, these dynamics. So myopic coordination can still be worse than myopic selfishness. Okay, so uh, again, I won't go into details, but there's an interesting example uh, that demonstrates that. Okay, so, um, okay, since I don't have much time, so uh, I'll just say that, uh, okay, let me just go back to this result uh, because uh, we have the social utility converging and then uh, the state also converging to a set of Nash equilibria we would like to say something about what the steady state social utility is. Okay, so uh, in general, we can't say uh, what that is, but uh, we may want to give some bounds on that uh, steady state social utility. Okay, first is, uh, okay, I won't go into this, but uh, but basically we define some notion called quasi-concave hill. And um, okay, so it's a, it's a very interesting definition, but okay, so if the graph is a QCH, then in fact, uh, we can guarantee that uh, uh, we have a unique Nash, Nash equilibrium and all three dynamics converge to the same state. Okay, and uh, uh, for a general graph, uh, we give upper and lower bounds. Uh, we have uh, elaborate algorithms to do that, uh, but essentially for the upper bound, uh, we sort of uh, reduce the graph based on initial conditions and some estimates of mass population fraction uh, that may be there in, in each node I over time. And then we solve the convex problem, convex optimization problem. For lower bound, it's a, it's a lot more tricky, uh, but again, so we do we partition the graph and then uh, uh, in an appropriate manner, again, we solve an optimization problem uh, to get a lower bound. Okay, so uh, we just did some simulations uh, on an 18 node graph. Uh, this is the graph. Uh, and um, so for example, here, we do see that uh, the upper and lower bounds returned by our algorithm are indeed bounds, upper and lower bounds for the actual steady state social utility for these dynamics. So the value of algorithm is really seen in these numbers here. So for example, if you simulate these dynamics, uh, then SSD takes two minutes, okay, not much. NBRD and NRPM, they do take a, a lot of time, nine hours and five hours, but then uh, the bounds we can compute in just 3.48 seconds. Okay, so that's orders of magnitude improved. Uh, we also evaluated the performance of these bounds with uh, varying graph sparsity. Uh, okay, so long story short, uh, especially the uh, upper bound does really well as the edge probability increases, right? So as the graph uh, sparsity decreases in the graph. Okay, so, uh, okay, I won't go into the details about the rest of that uh, slide. Okay, and okay, so the, I, I won't uh, summarize. I think that, okay, fine. And I just want to acknowledge, uh, basically, this is a collaborative work with uh, one of my students, Nirav Mandal, uh, and we had some conference paper too, but then uh, these two papers which are available in archive, I have the details if you're interested, uh, you can check. Okay, so thank you for listening to me. Thanks a lot, Pavan, for powering through in the last few minutes, really appreciate uh, that. Uh, while we have Vaibhav setting up his slides, if anyone has questions for Pavan, please ask away. So why don't you can start sharing your screen? Uh, yeah. Thank you. It's visible. So any questions for Pawan?
Okay, thank you. If, if not, Neil, you can always drop a note to him offline, and uh, he, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. So next up, we'll move on to Viber. Uh, so Viber is a faculty at uh, the EC depa department as well as the Bosch Center here at IIS. And uh, he works in the area of uh, control theory, optimizations, communication theory, and so on. And he's going to be talking to us about optimal load altering attacks in power system. Viber, all yours. You're not audible yet. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, thanks, uh, Yogesh. So since uh, I have very less time, probably 10, 12 minutes. So I'll in this talk, I'll briefly explain one very specific mathematical problem that uh, we have been working on recently and how we can apply this approach uh, in analyzing uh, load altering attacks in power systems. And this is a joint work with uh, Fabio Pasqualetti at uh, UC Riverside. So let me move ahead. So I'll not go into the details. We all know that security is a very much crucial topic in cyber physical systems, since there are multiple types of attack possible due to the communication and computing capabilities present in these systems. So we need to identify vulnerable locations and vulnerable types of attacks in these systems. And uh, specifically in this talk, I'll focus on, on power grid, the first uh, figure on top left. Okay, so let me go straight into the problem. So normally what happens is that in a, in a power grid, there is a frequency regulation mechanism. And this is typically uh, done uh, via controllable and frequency responsive loads. So what happens is that if in a grid, the, the frequency decreases, uh, then you decrease the load. And if the frequency of the grid increases, then you increase the load. So this is the typical regulation mechanism. Uh, to regulate the grid frequency. But what can happen is that the attacker, if, the, if an attacker gets hold of these uh, loads, then it can do the exact opposite. So basically if your uh, grid frequency decreases, then the attacker can increase the load and vice versa. So this can uh, induce a positive feedback in the loop. And as a result, the overall grid frequency can become uh, very large or very small. It can deviate from the nominal value and this is how the attack can happen. So basically uh, we need to uh, uh, study how resilient is our system or how resilient is the power grid with respect to these type of attacks. That is what we study in this problem. So let me straight into go into the power system model that we use. So in the model we have some generators and some loads and we assume that the transmission lines are lossless and there is no objective power. So this is a typical equation, uh, a simplified equation for a generator in a, in a power grid. And here we have the usual suspects. Uh, the MI is the moment of inertia, DI is the damping coefficients. Omega is the frequency deviation from the nominal value. And this omega, we want it to be as close to zero as possible. This first term here, PMI denotes the mechanical power input to the generator. And uh, this last term denotes the power generated by the generator. So this is the, the generator model. Uh, next, uh, next, I will model this first term here, the mechanical power input model. So this mechanical power input model is again a combination of two terms. The first term is a proportional term and the second term is an integral term. And this model arises when uh, the, the mechanical input is a combination of a turbine governor controller and the load frequency controller. Again, if you're not familiar with power systems, uh, you can just treat it as a kind of a PI controller. Okay, and then we have a standard power flow equations in the, in the power grid here, uh, theta, these theta values are the phase angle deviations and uh, these L, Lij denote the transmission line admittance. So these are standard models in power grid. So if you don't understand this completely, that is completely fine. I'll simplify this uh, later on. Uh, this is uh, somewhat important, the load model, right? So we are trying to control the loads. So you can imagine like in our smart homes, we have different types of loads. And nowadays we have a increasing capability of choosing those loads in real time. So a typical load has two components. The first part here is a frequency sensitive load. So as your frequency changes, this component will change automatically. So you cannot really control this. Uh, the second part is typically the uh, frequency insensitive part and you can really control this part. 
And this is the part that the attacker gains hold into and uh, it can try to vary these loads in such a way to destabilize the, the whole system. Okay, so now finally, the last equation for the attack model. So how does the attacker attack the system? So here we use a proportional kind of a controller. So here the, the, the loads are varied in proportional to the uh, grid frequencies. So this is what this equation says. So it's a proportional type of controller and the, the proportionality constant here, Kij, this, these are the constants that the attacker wants to determine in order to destabilize the network. So simply put, the attacker's goal is to pick these constants, Kij's, such that it can destabilize the whole system. That is the goal of the attacker in, in, in this scenario. Okay, so if you combine all those equations that I mentioned before, you get this simplified model. And this simplified model is typically known as singular linear system. So it, here this matrix E is a singular matrix. So that's why the term uh, singular linear system. If this matrix E is identity, then it uh, boils down to the standard uh, linear system. Okay, so This is the model of the whole overall power system and the overall attack combined together. And again, this is, this is a simplified model uh, to, to uh, perform the analysis. Okay, so now we'll work with the simplified model. And remember the attacker's goal is to find this delta, uh, this perturbation delta that can destabilize the system. So basically it wants to shift the eigenvalues of the system to the right half plane. That is the goal of the attacker. And within this goal, it needs to take care of two things. The first thing is that the attacker has access to only a subset of loads and frequency measurements, right? So for example, in this matrix, you can see that the second row is zero. This means that the attacker does not have access to the second load in the system. Similarly, the third column is zero. This means that, that the attacker does not have access to the third frequency in the system. So this sparsity uh, structure of this matrix determines what the knowledge uh, that is available to the attacker and what uh, loads are accessible by the attacker. So typically this sparsity structure can be anything. Uh, so the, the framework is valid for any sparsity structure. And the second uh, goal of the attacker is to choose the least amount of load that, it, that can be compromised uh, to destabilize the system. Because it does not want, uh, so suppose the attacker needs to access a large amount of loads in the system, then uh, its purpose is defeated. So it, it wishes to minimize the, the amount of load that can be compromised to destabilize the system. And this results in minimizing uh, this norm of this uh, matrix delta here. Okay. So these are the two considerations. And uh, next, uh, let me try to visualize the problem before presenting the solutions, right? So for that, uh, let us denote what is known as the spectral value sets. So this is nothing but all the eigenvalues of uh, this matrix, such that the norm of this perturbation is less than some value eta here, okay? So let's start with neta equal to zero, right? So if eta is zero, then this delta will also be zero. And therefore you have only these four eigenvalues in this, uh, in this case. But what happens is that as you start increasing this value of eta, these eigenvalue sets will start growing, okay? And there will be a point, uh, so these sets will grow as eta increases, so here eta is 0.3, and there will be a point where these sets will touch this imaginary axis. So this whole figure is a complex plane, and here you can see that these sets are finally touching the imaginary axis. And this is the precise point of stability radius. This is the point that we want to find. Because if, if delta is increased beyond this point, then your system will become unstable. So this is the, uh, the, the critical point that we, we want to find in this, in this problem. Okay, so to capture all this uh, goal of destabilization, we form this optimization problem. Again, we want to minimize the norm of this perturbation delta. Uh, as I explained before. So this is the cost function and there are two constraints in this problem. The first constraint is the eigenvalue uh, assignment constraint. So basically we want the eigenvalues of the system to lie on the imaginary axis. And this is precisely because we want to capture these uh, points where these spectral value sets touch the imaginary axis. So therefore we want eigenvalues to be 
uh, lying exactly on the imag imaginary axis. And the second constraint is the sparsity constraint that I uh, mentioned previously. So this perturbation uh, needs to be of an exact sparsity structure and that is captured by uh, this constraint. I'll not go into the details, but you can use this Hadamard product to capture this. Okay. So basically when you solve this problem, you will get this, the stability radius of the system. And a small value of the stability radius implies more vulnerability, right? Because if the value is small, then the attacker can um, basically change only a few loads and it can result in instability. So ideally we would want uh, this uh, optimal value to be large for the system to be more resilient. Okay, so this is the original problem that I described. I'll not go into the details, but what we do is we transform this original problem into a more relaxed uh, and unconstrained problem. So here on the left, uh, basically we have the problem with some constraints, but on the right side, uh, we can show that we can convert this problem into an unconstrained problem uh, by using some uh, penalty based methods. And also we use uh, Sylvester equation based parameterization. Again, I'll not go into the details due to lag of time, but uh, the main point is that we convert this original problem into a more into a relaxed problem, which is much more feasible. And since this is an unconstrained problem, we can use standard gradient descent or Newton descent method to, to solve this uh, more relaxed problem. Okay, so just a couple of slides on the simulations and then I'll conclude. So here we have a, a IEEE 39 bus power network, which has 10 generators and 29 loads. And here in this case, uh, we consider the, the scenario where there's an attack on load number 11 based on measurements from generator number one. So since uh, there is attack on only one load and the measurement is available on from only one generator, a single only a single entry of this matrix delta can be non-zero. Remaining all the entries will be, the, will be zero. And here you can see in these figures that uh, as you increase or uh, as you decrease this value of delta uh, one comma one, your system will be, uh, goes from, from being stable uh, to marginally stable, and then it becomes unstable in this last figure. So in the last figure, you can see that uh, the signal is, is, uh, is, is growing as time increases. So we have uh, encountered uh, instability. And in the second figure, we are just at, at a brink of uh, being unstable. Okay, so finally, uh, this is the final uh, simulation point. So. Uh, remember a lower value of this stability radius implies more vulnerability. So we basically plot this optimal value of uh, Delta star for all the uh, loads in this, uh, uh, in this uh, network. So this is the figure and this figure basically shows that for example, load number 20 is the most vulnerable load in the system. So all the resources that uh, we, we have to prevent these attacks should be targeted towards uh, these a lower spectrum of the loads. So basically using this framework, we can generate a vulnerability profile of the whole network that which points are more vulnerable and which points are less vulnerable. So this uh, basically gives an idea on how resilient is the whole network and which locations are more resilient than the other locations. Okay. So this is uh, the end of my talk. Uh, so just to summarize, we we formulated a, a optimal problem, optimal optimization problem for uh, dynamic and sparse load altering attacks. And we relaxed the problem and then we showed that we can use this framework to develop a vulnerability map of the, of the whole system. So that's it from my side, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot Viber for a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, we can take any quick questions if the audience uh, has any, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I'll ask Shishir, Shishir to uh, set up his slides uh, for the next talk. Any questions for Vaibhav? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Vaibhav. So, and we'll move on to uh, Shishir. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, uh, Shishir uh, Kalteya is an assistant professor at the RBC CPS, uh, and as well as in the computer science uh, and automation department here at IISC. Uh, he has a PhD in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech, and his uh, research interests are in the area of uh, 
uh, multi-leg robotics and uh, we are looking forward to hearing talk on learning plus control for leg locomotion uh, shishi all yours okay thank you yogesh you can see the slide right yes we can okay great great okay so i will try to uh, go really fast because we have to finish it fast so i'll be talking about learning come control for leg locomotion uh, to be more precise uh, uh i would like to explain a little, little more about learning and the control aspects specific for record locomotion uh, after what we have seen recently over the past couple of years so this is a very very recent result and uh, uh, i will try to finish it as soon as possible okay uh, so uh, let me introduce the team i have to give credit to the entire team of course so bharatwaj shalab ashitawa ashish aditya pramod and a lot of other research interns and research assistants who have been helping all throughout. Uh, so we have three robots, uh, three walking robots. Uh, all are made in IAC, developed in IST, and they have they are powered by servo motors and they have basic electronics, cheap electronics. And we have gone to several venues uh, with, with these robots. Uh, for example, ICRA 2019, IRAS 2021, Coral 2020, and so on and so forth. Uh, and here are our latest results Perfect. on walking. Uh, stop light, uh, it's very robust right now. It's able to recover from my uh, ear uh, This is uh, uh, the stock light being cut up through this wooden board. And uh, we have stock three, uh, early version of stock three. Stock three is a much bigger robot and a stronger robot. Uh, and uh, it's, so we just made finished making leg one leg for this robot, and uh, yes, I'm just simply showing uh, the simulation results of this one. Okay, uh, coming back to the, the main part of the talk, uh, walking robot research has come a long way. As a matter of fact, it has matured significantly and there is a growing interest in legged robots even in India. Uh, so we have Boston Dynamics, we have Animal, uh, we have a lot of other robots from Italy, USA, and lots of other countries. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, the mini cheetah, and on the right hand side, we have the animal from ETH Zurich. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the field has gotten really mature, so much so that now there are conflicting ideologies, conflicting philosophies. So there is one paper which shows amazing behaviors like backflips, and then say that they have achieved this good model predictive control. And on the right hand side, we see amazing uh, recovery behaviors on the slippery ice. And they say that it's because of reinforcement learning. So for an outsider, it's very difficult to decide. So let's say that outsider has to, has to build a robot. Now, what, which controller will be chosen? So the question is, who will win here? MPC or reinforcement learning? Model predictive control or reinforcement learning? And that's the whole part of this talk. Uh, so this is the quick outline. So uh, in order to understand what is better, what is worse, and so on and so forth. We have to first understand the, the, the fundamentals between the differences between control and learning. And with this understanding, uh, we'll try to take the best from both the worlds. In fact, both are very important. Both have their use cases. And we'll try to understand this in, in a very fast way, given the time constraints. To be more specific, I'll compare model predictive control and model free re of policy reinforcement learning algorithms. Okay, so let me begin with the first part. So to, to explain this better, I'm going to bring the, the control architecture that was used on that ice walking robot. Uh, we can see uh, MLPs, we, we can see TNC encoders, we, we can see perception, terrain estimation, and a lot of these modules. And I would like to focus your attention on the bottom most part, the C control architecture. And here we can see foot trajectory generator, inverse kinematics, joint PD controller, robot dynamics, so the more I look at it, the more I realize this is not really 100% learning, reinforcement learning, right? There is a significant part of this, which is actually doing model-based control, right? Which includes the kinematics, which includes the dynamics. And this is like, this is classical control, right? And this is what it is actually. The devil is in the details. So if you look at a nice walking, look, nice looking robot, uh, we, can, we can see that it is working really well. Uh, and there are several contributing factors to that, right? And this is what I would like to point your attention to. This is exactly the case even for the other robot, the mini cheetah robot. So, so in order to understand this better, let me try to compare uh, 
the domain of control and the domain of learning. So feedback control, which is the foundation of control using feedback. And we have stochastic approximation, which is the foundation of reinforcement learning. And if you try to understand this more, uh, we have yt, and the goal is to drive yt to some desired value. Uh, and there are cert certain kinds of guarantees that we can actually talk about. For example, for linear systems, we can talk about exponential convergence, we can talk about controllability, and so on and so forth. And this is more viewed like a loop. And we can talk about uh, stability and uh, lots of other properties. Similarly, on the right hand side, we have this function and we would like to drive it to some desired value, ideally minimize or maximize it. And again, here we can try to provide some guarantees. Uh, like if, if, for example, if there is some boundedness properties of the iterex theta t, uh, then we can think of talking about convergence, right? So the left-hand side is more viewed like a loop and the right-hand side is more viewed like an algorithm, right? So the difference is not huge. Similarly, if, you, if I talk about model predictive control and reinforcement learning, they're both doing the same, trying to minimize or maximize some cost criterion. And the, I, the goal is to choose the best sequence of states and control that minimizes this cost subject to some constraints. But the subtle difference is for, for something like model predictive control, uh, we use the structure of the cost and the model to get the best sequence of inputs. On the other hand, for reinforcement learning, we simply sample the cost and the state transitions. And then again, by observing these samples, we obtain the best sequence of inputs. So in one sentence, I can say that MPC emphasizes more on the model and less on the data and reinforcement learning emphasizes less on the model and more on the data, right? Now let's talk about the, 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 the domain of locomotion. So for, for a robot like animal, where they have used reinforcement learning to learn some very complex behaviors, the best way to use the model there is to somehow try to model some parts of the robot. And that's what they have done actually. And that's where the low level module comes in, right? Similarly for, for something like the mini cheetah where they have shown they have used model predictive control, they have used data, except that they have not explicitly mentioned it. They have done system ID for that. And that's how they're able to get better behaviors. So both have done both. Both, the, both, the, both of these robots have both of these techniques being incorporated. So with this understanding, let's try to combine the two. Uh, so let, let's try to combine control and learning, specifically MPC and model three of policy RL, which I mentioned previously. So coming back to walking in, so we have the standard RL template. There are several benefits of using RL, like I said previously. The, the, the first advantage is if I have to make the robot learn by itself, I would go for a learning technique, right? So this requires, this does not require me to understand the complex dynamics and still achieve complex behaviors. But if you look at the existing RL techniques, and if you look at the number of iterations that are required, for example, for this half cheetah uh, to achieve 6,000 rewards, it takes three, and 3 million iterations for the first technique, which is called the DDPG. For the second one, which is called the TD3, it takes 500,000 iterations. Similarly for the SAC, right? Now, this is a lot of iterations from a practical standpoint. We cannot think of applying millions of iterations on a practical system, on a real hardware. So there is a real problem here. So this is when we can think of incorporating the model and then use this model information to improve the sampling efficiency. And that's what the focus here, here has been. And I have to give credit to Soumya and Utkarsh, my students, who have been working full time on combining these uh, learning, and, learning and control techniques and come up with a nice way of formalizing it. So, so for in order to explain it better, let me simply show the, the Bellman equation here. So I have this value function here, which is nothing but the minimum of the expectation of the cost plus the gamma times the value function for the next state. So here we have a single stage cost. Now I can expand this and convert this into an end stage cost, which is what the next equation is, right? So I have this end stage cost and the last cost is again the value function. Right? I'm not really changing anything else. Now the end stage cost actually is an end step MPC formulation. So this is when we can think of using the model. So we can try to minimize this end stage cost 
using the model and at the same time learn the value function p through rl so now we have like a two loop approach which is very very effective oops sorry okay sorry uh, so let me introduce this one by one so there are two loops like i mentioned so one interacts with the model right so there is some kind of training in the for, for, for the inner loop so this is called the inner loop and then this can be connected with the real environment and now i have an outer loop so the inner loop interacts with the model the outer loop interacts with the environment right so now we can think of using techniques like mbpo mbpo is a classic example for an inner loop outer loop technique where they learn the model and then train on that and then similarly given this information we can similarly we can similarly train the outer loop so we have planning on the model which is the classic mpc and we have learning on the outer loop which is the classic reinforcement learning so in order to explain this even better so let me try to give you some timelines of what we are doing exactly so first we collect data from the environment and then we try to fit the model and the value function and then plan we collect even more data and this cycle repeats alternatively we can collect environment data fit the model and train the policy on this model itself apply policy on the environment and collect even more data right now when you think about this more and more you can think of several permutations and combinations so here is another example collect environment data fit the model do an mpc planner collect model data combine the two and then train your policy and the value function on both the model and the environment data and as a matter of fact uh starting from 2019 all the way till now quite a few papers have come out which actually talk about several variants in this and our approach which is actually the third part, third one uh, m demo rl uses dynamic mirror descent algorithms for solving the inner loop in, in mpc so i cannot get into the details the mathematical details of this due to the time constraints uh, but here we simply use one of those uh, classic mirror descent techniques that was that is used for online learning that is used for mpc here and then now we have a classic model based model tree approach which with this mpc formulations so this is our formulation so i have an out outer loop which is again of policy rl so i can you think of using any of the self of the shelf rl algorithms and with this oops can you still see the screen yes the screen is uh, okay. seen for some reason my screen is frozen Ah, oh, okay. Now it is back. I don't know why. Okay, you are able to see this, right? So now, and then I have an MPC here. So I use mirror descent on the MPC here to get a better algorithm. So with this, let me conclude. Uh, uh, we have results which which are compared with the existing model-based model free approaches, and as you can see, the pink curve is reaching the peak much faster, which means that we are way more sampling sampling sample efficient. so let me conclude by saying that i i proposed a generic framework for solving the mpc in the inner loop in other words i proposed a dmd mpc with the model tree of policy rl uh, and then with this formulation uh, we can think of doing several variants uh, and we not only have that we have flexibility of using off the shelf rl algorithms along with the dmd mpc so with this i thank everyone for listening great thanks a lot shashir that's really cool <laughs> demos and uh, it's, it's great to see the robots here on campus i should come and take a look at it on your lab sometime uh, so any questions for shashir we have maybe a minute uh, before we have to wrap up shashir i had a question yeah can you comment on like how uh, coarse the model can be like the uh, your initial Uh, model that you assume for mpc right for instance if i was to look at it at a wheel robot type of situation can i start with like a kinematic model though i know it's going to be slightly wrong and the right thing to do is like a dynamic model okay so that's actually a very good question i wanted to talk about it uh, so 
the goal should not be to find the most accurate model. The goal should be to find the find a good model that best represents the task that you, that is interested that is interesting to you. So in our case, uh, we are using four legs. So it's more like a flat robot. And uh, what is a good model for that? A point mass or maybe a potato model, a rigid body model is sufficient for that. So we have not used it here, uh, but that is definitely in the plan. We are planning to do that uh, for, for the next, for the actual robot training. Uh, so currently we are using the neural network model just to show the efficiency of this method. But we want to eventually use a rigid body model for this quadruped, train on that, and then again train on the actual robot. Right? And at the same time, estimate a better rigid body model based on the data that you get from the experiments. So that is our next goal. So it depends on the task to, to say it in one line. Okay, got it. Great. Thanks a lot, Shishir. So uh, with that, we'll wrap up this session uh, because uh, we have a really exciting uh, session coming up in about